Today, I thought I'd talk about asthma management guidelines and how they affect the way that your asthma is treated. So what are asthma guidelines? These are really recommendations which are aimed at doctors, nurses and other healthcare professionals that look after your asthma. The guidelines are also used by health service providers to decide on what treatments they will pay for and what services they'll provide. So the main reasons why guidelines are developed is because medical research moves very quickly. So new drugs are developed, new research on how these drugs are useful is published, and so the research initially is to discover new drugs and test them for safety in humans, and then once a drug is shown to work, for example for asthma or an aspect related to asthma, the drugs are then tested in clinical trials, and these clinical trials will compare those drugs against usual treatment or against so-called placebos to see if they are effective. Now, placebos are inactive drugs, and that is, they're made up to look the same as the real drugs so that people in drug trials don't know if they're taking the real active drug or the inactive placebo. And this will help researchers to decide whether the drug itself is useful and safe. The reason why placebos are used in drug trials is that our minds do play tricks on us, and sometimes simply believing that a particular drug or something is going to help us will result in benefit. So to explain how this works, let me tell you about a research study which was done many years ago where the researchers used different coloured placebo tablets in comparison with active pain relievers like paracetamol and aspirin. And guess what? In many people, some of these inactive coloured placebo tablets worked as well as the pain tablets in a number of those people who were tested. So drug trials have to prove that the drugs work better than our beliefs that a drug will work which is how placebos work. That is, if we believe that something will help, it may well do so, even if it is an inactive drug. The other way that research is done is that drugs and systems for treatment are compared against other drugs or usual treatment. And what the researchers are trying to find out is whether this new form of treatment is better than the usual form of treatment or treatment with other drugs. This kind of research is called controlled research or research against a control of some kind, where, for example, the usual treatment will be used as the control for comparison with a new treatment. Then there is research to find out the best way to use those drugs. And these research studies will usually test the new method against a method that's currently being used. And there's a very nice example that's recently changed the way that we manage asthma. For over 50 years, we've been prescribing the short-acting reliever inhalers, those are the blue ones, for relief of asthma symptoms. However, there have been a number of research studies that have indicated that this is not the safest way to treat asthma. And that's mainly because asthma involves a process of inflammation and that causes swelling of the air passages with collection of inflammatory cells or mucus inside the air passages and substances get released which make the air passages go tight or go into spasm. Now the blue relievers only work against the spasm and not against the cause of the spasm, that's the inflammation and they do not work against the other aspects of asthma inflammation. Use of blue inhalers is associated with poor outcomes like asthma deaths. So there have been four large research studies in the last five years that have provided that a two-in-one inhaler, that is an inhaler which contains a reliever and an anti-inflammatory inhaled corticosteroid, was better for treating asthma symptoms. It also reduced the number of severe attacks. So, by delivering the anti-inflammatory drug using the vehicle of a reliever inhaler, 
two things are achieved. You get relief from the spasm of the air passages, and also you get to treat the inflammatory process which is causing that flare-up of asthma. Now also, the research found that the two-in-one inhaler actually prevents severe attacks. So as a result of this groundbreaking research, asthma is being treated differently. That is, in people with mild asthma, instead of using a blue inhaler, we're recommending that they use one of the licensed two-in-one anti-inflammatory reliever inhalers. Now, there are different two-in-one inhalers all over the world. These are those inhalers that contain both the reliever and the anti-inflammatory drug. And not all of these are licensed for use as needed. However, 48 countries, including the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Canada and Russia, have licensed these drugs for as-needed use in mild asthma. In addition, different ways of delivering care can also be researched. So, for example, you may have heard the podcast last month on the way that paediatric teams in Northern Ireland organise their follow-up of children after a child has had an asthma attack. Now, in that research, they tested ways to ensure that children were seen by a specialist nurse soon after being admitted to hospital for that attack. And they found that it helped to pre-warn parents and children before discharge from hospital that they would be sent an appointment to attend for a review in the next week or two. And this, plus a phone call soon after the discharge from hospital to remind people, helped to increase the numbers of people who attended for those reviews. And this was very important research because we know that an asthma attack is a risk factor for another asthma attack. So it's really important for someone who has had an asthma attack to be reviewed soon afterwards by somebody trained in asthma care to find out what preventive factors or what preventable factors could be identified that could be modified and fixed, in other words, to prevent a future attack. So the way that treatment is provided may change as a result of new research. Now the big problem is that doctors and nurses are extremely busy, and while they do try and keep up to date with new drugs and treatment developments, they cannot know everything about every disease they manage. And I think I mentioned before in one of my podcasts that an average general practitioner will deal with over 400 different clinical conditions in an average year. And that GP cannot know everything about all of those conditions. Okay, so let's say drug research has been done and systems for treating asthma have been done. Now one of the difficulties is to implement the results of that research. And One of the biggest problems is interpretation of those research findings in a way that a clinician or a doctor or a nurse can use that information for the best benefit of their patient. So, for example, if a study, a research study, shows that a drug works in 60% of those people who were studied, and in the placebo arm of that study, let's say it only worked in 40% of those people studied. So you could conclude that it's better to use that drug than to use a placebo or to use something different. But what about the 40% of those people who did not improve on that drug? So you can't take that research study that says that 60% of people got better using that particular drug or that process and say that that's going to work in everybody. So research studies are not really fixes for everybody. In other words, one size does not fit everyone. So when deciding on whether to try a particular drug on a patient or a new kind of treatment, you do need to be able to interpret the research results and you need to be flexible to be able to change your prescription or the way you treat a patient if it doesn't work. So an example in asthma is the drug called Montelukast, which does work in some people, 
but not in most people. So if there's no effect after prescribing that drug after about six weeks, or if there are side effects, then it should be stopped. And also, if a drug is only tested in adults, it may not work in children. So the problem really for clinicians is to interpret these research findings, if they've managed to read the latest research findings, that is. And this is where guidelines come in. Guidelines are developed by experts in the particular subject, and we're talking about asthma today. So asthma guidelines are developed by adult and pediatric specialists in asthma. And these specialists might work in hospital, they might work in general practice, they might be nurses, pharmacists, they may be doctors or other healthcare professionals. So these guideline developers have the task of reading and assessing the quality of new published research in asthma and then making recommendations for generalists on how to use these drugs to treat their patients. By generalists, I mean people who are not specialists in asthma care. So the guideline developers will make recommendations based on detailed scrutiny and examination of many research papers on when, how and what circumstances and in what populations to use particular drugs or methods for treatment. So as a result, doctors who are not specialists in a particular subject are provided with clear guidance on how best to manage their patients. So asthma guidelines are developed by individual countries and there may be different guidelines within a country. They may have different aims and they may be modified by local specialists within these countries. Ideally, there should be one guideline for asthma that everyone uses. However, they differ for a number of reasons. And those reasons they differ might include availability of drugs or equipment in your location or country, the cost of these drugs and equipment, government policies, and availability and influence of local experts who could drive the use of these guidelines. And of course, there are many other reasons so there may be differences in guideline recommendations available for doctors who are not asthma specialists to use. And these differences result from the way the guidelines are developed and what their purpose is. So for example, in the United Kingdom, we've had two different conflicting asthma guidelines. One, the so-called NICE guideline from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which is based on economics and costs. And this guideline did not include anything about managing acute asthma. So people who were only referring to that guideline would not be familiar of how to manage acute asthma. So in this guideline, the cheapest option was usually chosen. The other guideline in the UK has been the British Thoracic Society or SIGN guideline which is based on the evidence of how good the drugs work in the population. And as a result, many United Kingdom doctors have been confused about which to follow. Now, the United Kingdom are busy developing a single guideline, which will be available sometime in the next few years. Now, I did say that different guidelines are developed differently. Some will focus on a number of key questions. So, for example... What's the best way to diagnose asthma? Which self-management plan works the best? Which drugs should be used when first diagnosing asthma? And which drugs should be used when treating severe asthma? And then these guidelines will be updated from time to time, sometimes after three or five years. And clearly, because research is happening all the time, and a lot of it is happening all the time, Many of these guidelines are out of date very quickly. Now, some guidelines adopt a nationwide approach and have representation from different sectors in the community. For example, the National Asthma Management Plan in Finland, which includes patients, schools, doctors, nurses, governments, specialists and generalists. And this guideline has been very successful 
in reducing Asma deaths in Finland to the lowest in the whole world. Another example of a simplified national guideline is the one developed in New Zealand, where everyone follows the same management plan in the community. There is one international guidance document produced by an organisation called the Global Initiative for Asthma, or GINA, which I'm very proud to be a member of. And this group produces evidence-based strategy documents on asthma. And these strategy documents are updated every single year after scrutiny of the latest publications of asthma, all publications, not just on particular key questions, that have been published in the previous 18 months. And the GINA documents are used unchanged by many countries, and others, like New Zealand, incorporate the GINA recommendations within their guidance documents. So how does all this help you? If you or your child have asthma, it may be worth your while to familiarise yourself with the asthma guidelines which are being used in your country or in your local area, because some local areas develop their own guidelines. And you may also want to read through the GINA strategy documents. There are some summary documents and there are some documents which are aimed particularly at people with asthma. And if you have a look through the GINA strategy, which is usually the most up-to-date evidence-based guidance worldwide. Similarly, if you are a healthcare professional with responsibility for caring for people with asthma, you should, of course, familiarise yourself with the latest guidance. People with asthma who are familiar with what the guidelines suggest for your asthma care can use this information both to reinforce the education that's provided by your doctor or your asthma nurse, and also to help you to ask appropriate questions when you consult for your or your child's asthma. And of course, knowing what the guidelines recommend for asthma care, you will be able to know what you can expect from your healthcare professionals in terms of your asthma care. So in summary, I've spoken about asthma guidelines and shared some of the ways they are developed based on the research that is published. Not all asthma guidelines are up to date, so it's worth checking with your doctor or your asthma nurse which guideline they're using for deciding on your treatment. So you could then locate and read that guideline to improve your understanding of what to expect for your asthma care and also to understand why particular decisions have been made in terms of your asthma care. Now remember that guidelines are not suitable for everyone. They are guidance documents, and your doctor might decide to override guidance documents based on what your doctor knows about your clinical condition. So, in other words, asthma management is not one size fits all. A guideline is not a tram line which doctors follow rigidly. The guideline will help your doctor to select the best option for treating you depending on the local facilities, local drug availabilities and your or your child's particular asthma and how it affects you. Now another thing that I explained is that asthma guidelines may not cover all aspects of asthma care. So it all depends how they are actually designed. So if they're only looking at a group of key questions, that's all that that particular guideline will address. And also remember, they may not be up to date. So if you're reading a guideline document online, have a look and see what date it was published. And then doctors may choose treatment based on the latest published evidence if they are up to date by um, following the latest guidelines. Have a look at the link to my website, which will give you links to different asthma guidelines and also to the Global Strategy for Asthma website. If you do find this podcast useful, I'd be delighted and very grateful if you would share it as widely as possible.